Some of you may become somewhat uncomfortable as parts of this film unfold, but I think if you listen carefully, nature has intended to give you a healthy, happy sex life. Is a wonderful and terribly unpleasant. We've all experienced curiosity about ourselves and the opposite sex. Who hasn't? Hello, everyone. I'm Megan. I'm Marcella. And I'm Colin. And, and welcome, welcome to, to Remedial, Remedial Sex, Sex Ed. Ed. Yeah. I forgot how we do things. Yes, <laughs> you did. It's been too long you since you've been guest. here. We have a special guest with us again. <laughs> uh, yeah, Marcella's <laughs> returning to the podcast. Boop, 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 boop. Uh, <laughs> hi. Hi, everybody. I missed you guys. Hello. Yeah, they missed you too. Friends. And we missed you, of course. We just had a long conversation off mic about how much we missed you <laughs> yes um yeah no i miss doing this this crazy shenanigan as well great job hosting the podcast in my absence friends we had fun we had fun we, we talked mostly about how we're, we're pagan now sexual spooktober <laughs> i mean i go away time. for a month and they become pagans and we're now we're witches <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> October, we mainly focused on uh, the spooky aspects of October and celebrating ha- Halloween as a sexy month because it is sexual spooktober. October <laughs> is also Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Yes. Which we kind of glazed over, but luckily um, we have November, which is commonly referred to as Movember. Uh, Movember, in accordance with all websites, as directly written about it, is a celebration of men's health awareness. Now, of course, that r- refers to anyone with a penis um, because the main focus would be things like t- testicular cancer, prostate cancer, and then they also lob in things like mental health and anything that relates specifically under the umbrella of Movember to anyone <laughs> celebrating is growing out their facial hair as much as they possibly can. Colin is just like that anyway. Constantly partic- Movember for Colin. Yeah. I don't. I don't like... <laughs> Even I don't like feeling blackmailed into doing things like, oh, you're not woke if you don't grow a mustache or like you you must hate cancer. You must hate people with cancer if you don't do this social media challenge. Like, no, it's don't blackmail me into doing something I don't want to do. So I am supportive that... of spreading awareness of these issues, but I am anti blackmail. I think that's going to be the first thing to get cut from this episode. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> Colin, the I'm not joining anyone's team. <laughs> I'll donate, but I don't like being made to do things. Jesus Christ. All right. So with any episode Why where we're dealing. Me? I'm right. <laughs> not right, but okay. I'm just kidding. <laughs> With any episode where we're relying on um, medical emphasis, such as this one, it's very hard to remain gender neutral since all of the literature is written gender specific. It's heavily gendered. Yes. And I mean, Movember is trying specific, is like specifically cisgendered men's health awareness, I suppose. And breast awareness, I mean, the color is pink and it's all very gendered towards women specifically. Um, and it's true that those born with a uterus are affected by breast cancer substantially more than those um, born with a penis and testicles. It does affect both genders, and while we on this podcast try to remain as gender neutral as possible, today's subject matter is going to be specifically about uh, cancers that affect our naughty bits. So, <laughs> bits. So our breasts, our testicles, our vaginas, our vulvas, our why bottoms. Are, why are these cancers so rigidly gendered? Like, and why is awareness around them so rigidly gendered? Like, is it should we be blaming Susan G. Coleman? Like, is it? <laughs> well, because breast cancer was the number one killer of women for quite a few years. Oh my gosh! Really? Yeah. Oh wow. So know. that would be why. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Um, so we're we're gonna try and remain as gender neutral as possible. But again, when we're talking specifically about the reproductive systems and about uh, particular gendered cancers, it's gonna be get very difficult, especially as we are directly reading from these websites that we are pulling from that all have the best intentions, everyone's ideas, just to get as much awareness and as much health 
as much equality out there as possible, but it's going to be tough. Please well, be forgiving. <laughs> not to mention that like almost all medical research or studies are done on cis people, cisgendered people. Yeah. And so, yeah, it is hard to, um, yeah, it's hard. <laughs> it's going to be hard. And we're going to try. Like, but yeah, we are we're going to try so hard. <laughs> When we did our episode on HPV, Gina gave a very good definition as to what cancer is and how it affects the body. Yes. We are going to splice that in now. Okay. Uh, in its simplest definition, cancer is just an abnormal growth of cells, like an out of control growth of cells. Um, normally, cells are very good at, you know, being evenly spaced and if a cell doesn't have a neighbor, then it will divide to fill that space. And if it feels a neighbor next to it, it won't divide because there's no space. Mm -hmm. But a cell that uh, doesn't have that inhibition and just keeps replicating, that's cancer. Thank you, Gina. Thanks, Gina. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that little tidbit. Excellent. So you can have cancer basically anywhere in your body and there are four different types of cancer this is in accordance with uh, all medical websites that you can go on whether it's the Mayo Clinic whether it's WebMD whether it's um, the American Cancer Society all of these have great resources for better understanding uh, the different types you can get the list is huge you basically if it's a body part you can get cancer there yep. which is terrifying well because as, as we learned uh, cancer is just like is an abnormal growth, right? Mm -hmm. That's what yep. Gina said, right? Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, the major types are uh, carcinoma, sarcoma, melanoma, lymphoma, and leukemia. And uh, these different five kind of are an umbrella term of how the different cancers affect your uh, body itself. Oh. Um, for things that affect organs and glands, like uh, breasts, the female reproductive system, the male reproductive system, colons, uh, and prostates, these would all fall under. Um, uh, this would all fall under the carcinoma umbrella. So that's the type of cancer that affects your glands. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. well, that's what we're talking about today. That is what we're talking about today. So. I'm going to go ahead and start and kick us off with breast cancer. Please do. So um, breast cancer is the most common and the most diagnosed type of cancer for those uh, born with the uterus. And actually, those who still have a uterus um, out there, it is most commonly diagnosed along with lung cancer. And um, while it was once the most common, it was the most common and most lethal type of cancer once upon a time, that is no longer true. Yay, um, science! The... Yeah, Yay! that's really good. <laughs> Probably due in no small part to the uh, rigidly gendered cancer awareness we were just talking about. Very true. Uh, yes. <laughs> Everything contains its opposite. <laughs> so... <laughs> Uh, we live uh, due to the advancements in medical technology and research that has been done over the course of the years. Um, it, if caught early enough, um, most women can live uh, 20 years after being diagnosed with breast cancer, which is amazing. Is it? Um, is is that a statistical average or? Mm -hmm. Wow, that's so great. 90% of women who are diagnosed early on enough live 10 years or more. That's which, awesome. Yeah, all of that's amazing. <laughs> all great things to know. So if you are diagnosed with cancer, it, of course, depends on... Um, or let's start with this. The way you discover if you have any particular type of cancer is abnormalities going around. And most... And this is true for... Uh, any type of uh, carcinoma cancer is you can usually see a discoloration uh, around the skin. You can feel a lump or there is some other health problem that happens in your body. If you go talk to your doctor, they can usually help you pinpoint it. 
in order to uh, kind of scan for breast cancer on yourself is if you feel an abnormal lump underneath the skin, that is a sign that you should go to your doctor. Um, abnormal changes in nipple coloration or size or a dimpling or kind of, I'm going to call it weirdness of the skin, whether it's discoloration <laughs> or change. Extremely scientific, yes. Yeah. <laughs> a weirdening of the skin. Weirdening of the skin. <laughs> I mean, um, let's be real. You don't have to check yourself. Be good partners to each other, you know? Yes. Yes. Heal up them breasts. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, if you have a lump, don't panic. That does not automatically mean something is wrong. Go see your doctor. Uh, get a mammogram. They will diagnose for you. Uh, and it might all be okay. Everything is going to be okay. Go see your doctor. Sounds good. Advice for life. Advice for life. Ask your doctor. Now, if you are diagnosed with cancer, um, there are a couple of treatments. Um, one is a common with all strands of cancer, which is a treatment of radioactive therapy, uh, chemotherapy. Chemo sucks. And anyone who's ever loved someone with cancer knows that. Um, in... There will also be uh, one of the treatments is a lumpectomy, which is where they go in to remove the specific tumor from your breast. Um, and or on top of that, you also have a partial breast removal, a mastectomy or a double mastectomy. So a mastectomy is when they remove mm -hmm. one of your breasts from your body. Double mastectomy is when they remove both of them from your body. And the reason they will do this is uh, one breast is to remove the cancer from your body because um, in any form of cancer, it can, if it gets to the lymph nodes, it will spread to other parts of your body. So removing the source helps um, contain it from spreading to any of your other organs. Mm -hmm. um, you can... Usually, while they're doing a mastectomy, also receive plastic surgery, if you so choose, in order to um, visually repair your breasts from appearing uh, abnormal, if you so choose. And I have been thinking about this a lot because of all the parts of my body, the one that I'm proudest of, are definitely my breasts. <laughs> they develop first, and I love them. <laughs> I'm very jealous of that love. <laughs> I'm also a big fan. <laughs> so if ever, I, I know that for me, if ever I was to be diagnosed, I think that would be my first thing is like, um, get it out of me and then get me to see a plastic surgeon almost immediately. Um, but you don't have to. I think you should love your body and you, regardless of how it is. And there are plenty of women out there who continue to love their body with or without one or both of their breasts. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Because survival is the most beautiful thing on the planet. And um, Megan, I think you were saying off recording how uh, uh, mastectomies can be done as preventative care as well. Yes, they can. So uh, famously, like, f I forget how many years ago, but uh, Angelina Jolie actually had a double mastectomy and um, a hysterectomy because her mother uh, had died of cancer while she was young. And to eliminate the possibility of her doing that to her kids, she opted to remove both of her breasts and her um, uh, uterus and her reproductive system. Uh, by eliminating these organs, it does... Uh, reduce the chances of you contracting these cancers. Um, there is evidence to support that the likelihood of getting breast cancer is hereditary. Uh, so if your family members had it, it's very possible that you will have it too. Yeah, as, as I understood, as I understand the situation, she was at pretty high risk of de developing breast cancer. Yes. So remember, she was the subject of a lot of like misogynist hate at the time, but it was actually like a very reasonable decision to have made oh very true yeah good for her and yeah. by default i guess um that would affect 
trans men who have a top surgery and that prevents their future likelihood as well. That it cool. does. Yeah. Great. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, as mentioned, uh, penis havers can get it. It's very uncommon. Mm. Yeah. Because men, women, everyone have breasts. And I'll get into that later. <laughs> um, uh, da, 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 what was I going to say? I had one more thing. Oh, um, there are a ton, a ton of places where you can go to donate money to breast cancer awareness, research, uh, survivors, treatment, everything. Um, many businesses during the month of October already donate money most of the proceeds to these cancer awarenesses as well. On top of that, I was doing research because the thought of trying to wear a bra while missing one boob or if trying to be comfortable post-surgery because any form of um, augmentation surgery on your breast is incredibly painful. It made me think of like what your options are. And actually, there's actually quite a few online for um, either one-sided um, bras or ones that give you padding or very realistic looking to even it out if you so choose. And also bras that are front opening or come with um, leakage packages or there's just, there's so many supportive, comfortable options to help you get through treatment and recovery from be- breast cancer. Hell yeah. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, that's great. Go on. Yes. Yay, entrepreneurs. <laughs> <laughs> so that's my spiel on breast cancer. Wow. That was good. Yeah. Uh, you can also have, as I said, you can have cancer of any part of your body. body so that includes ovaries, fallopian cancer, um, uterine cancer, any part of the um reproductive system can get it and again if you have cancers of these areas the best treatment option for you is removal Hmm. and the best way to discover it is by getting your yearly checkup with your doctor Um, truth you cannot feel for lumps of your uterus (laughs) (laughs) yeah the little bit of research that i've done i'm sorry i'm underprepared listeners (laughs) i just want you to know um but no the little bit of research that i uh saw um mentioned how the symptoms could be what you experience on a monthly basis as a uterine haver it could be weird uh spotting which happens to us regularly (laughs) um (laughs) And, and other things like that that we might not be able to catch on our own. So definitely go in and get them pap smears. Yay. Yay. Schmears. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Of all types. Yeah. Yeah. All right. And uh, yeah, you can, and no matter what gender you are, um, you can get uh, reproductive health, uh, re- reproductive cancer screenings at Planned Parenthood. Mm-hmm. So they offer all... No, no matter what your genital configuration is, you can go there and get screened for cancer. It's... I know so many people who that is their main provider for health services. So yes, yes to all of the shouting out of Planned Parenthood. Right. They are lovely. Support them. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's it's one thing to say, go talk to your doctor. But if you don't have health insurance, that's not really an option. So, But there are options out there for you that are... Uh, free or low cost. Yay, Yay. Planned Parenthood. Yay. Definitely hooray for Planned Parenthood. So uh, <laughs> my turn? Your turn. That, Your okay. turn. That, uh, okay. Pencils that, uh, down. I didn't know if that was a cue. <laughs> um, yeah, okay. So I'm here to talk to, I'm here to talk about uh, men's reproductive health and reproductive health for people who have a penis, a test, uh, penis, a penis, I, I said a testicles. Right. <laughs> Specifically um, only one. <laughs> just the one testicle. Uh, no, if you have a, a penis, testicles, and or a prostate, then uh, you are in danger of getting cancer in any or all of those. Um, fortunately, uh, penis and testicular cancer are not very common. Um, they account for about 0.4 and 0.8% of all cancers. Yeah, let's see, uh, 0.4 for penile cancer and 0.8 for testicular cancer. 
um, so you're not very likely to get them. Testicular cancer, uh, although it is extremely uncommon in terms of cancer, it is actually the most common form of cancer found between uh, cisgendered men between the ages of 15 and 35. So even though um, on the whole you're not very likely to get it, it is still recommended that you do regular self uh, self examinations. And a self examination for a testicular cancer is exactly what you're thinking. In fact, <laughs> I, yeah, uh, I think they even told the, told us about them in health class in our in our bad sex ed, didn't they? They tell us this is one of the areas that Utah is actually fairly good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so what you do is you basically just uh, squeeze and feel your your testicles, um, and you're looking for any abnormalities, which is kind of the catch, which is why they recommend you do it regularly, because you have to know what feels normal uh, in order to know what feels at abnormal. But you're looking for any lumps, you're looking for uh, swollenness or or hard, you know uh, hardness, that sort of thing. I want to be healthy to be healthy i touch myself up <laughs> yeah. i mean i, I think it, <laughs> nope go ahead I, I sorry i think anyone i think that that's the lesson that anyone can take from the from this podcast that you should touch yourself it's play okay with to yourself. Touch yourself play with yourself know what's normal and then you can know when when to look out for something that's abnormal but also um you know lumps in the testicles can be benign uh swelling can be caused by all sorts of things so don't panic if you do feel a lump or some swelling but that would be a time to go to Planned Parenthood and get a screening or to go to your physician uh penile cancer real quick like I said uh, 0.4 percent of all cancers is not very common and what 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 you're looking out there what you are looking out for there in penile cancer is um abnormalities on the outside of of your penis so rough patches uh sores that sort of thing again skin weirdening what skin weirdening yeah skin weirdening <laughs> <laughs> there it is which yes, is like it makes a comeback the number one sign of of most cancers a weirdening of the skin um so i, I was kind of going to be real brief on penile and testicular cancer because they are so uncommon but I wanted to take a good chunk to talk about prostate cancer because it is actually very common. It is the number one cancer discovered in uh, cisgendered American men. And so, and it's the number two cancer in uh, cis men worldwide, just behind lung cancer. So I think it is worth talking about. All yeah, the thing I important. had to say about testicular cancer is like the age, median age of 15 to 35, that's a young cancer. Well, um, yes, it's scary, but like I said, it's it's uncommon because it is the number one cancer of the age of people who are extremely unlikely to get cancer. Yeah. Does that make sense? That makes sense. Yeah. Because most cancers, when they give you like an age range, it's middle ages. That's that is a young range for. Yeah, yeah. it's 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 ki- kind of scary, but again, uncommon. Okay. Everything's fine. <laughs> everyone, everyone is cool. Yeah. Um, okay, so like I mentioned, prostate cancer is the second most common form of cancer worldwide found in cis men um, and accounts for about 14.5% of all cancers uh, in in that group. And uh, just behind lung cancer, which for reference is 15.5%. So compared wow. to the 08 and 0.4% that I talked about before, it's it's a big, big difference. So this is definitely something that should be on your radar. However, uh, neither the American Cancer Society nor the CDC recommend regular prostate cancer screenings for the average prostate haver below the age of 50. So it's nothing to get too worked up about. Really? However, uh, yeah, no, they they only recommend regular screening once you hit 50 for the average p- owner of a prostate. Wow. Cool. I didn't know that. That's that. That is different if you have a uterus. Oh, really? Like I swear, anytime you go to a doctor, if you have a uterus, they're always looking under the hood. <laughs> yeah, I think recently it's just been like every two to three years that you get a pap. Whereas, like, I feel like when I was a kid, it was every year. Huh. Um, yeah. But they're starting to space it out a little bit more. But yeah, no, they get under the hood the second you. <laughs> Well, I guess technically it's like when you start having sex or when you hit late teen years. Yeah, like 16 onwards. That is so foreign to me. For men, it's like, nah, no worries. 
Oh, no, it's no ugh. problem. It's an I ordeal because you got to get Viagra up in the like stirrups candy, and but... like <laughs> different, different set of expectations. Patriarchy <laughs> it affects even doctors, especially. Uh, I think what I, we're saying is it affects even cancer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> hey, and patriarchy's best friend racism is right there. Um, because if you are an African American, you are at a much higher risk. Not much. You are at a higher risk for all of these reproductive cancers than for um, people of other races. Really? Yes. So for prostate oh. cancer, the American Cancer Society recommends regular screening for African Americans at age 45. And if you are determined to be at a high risk for prostate cancer, and that usually means that someone in your immediate family has or has had prostate cancer, then you want to start getting screened at age 40. There's a little bit of controversy when it comes to prostates, uh, prostate cancer screening, because the CDC... So those recommendations that I said before were from the American Cancer Society. The CDC uh, doesn't have any specific recommendations for when someone who is at average risk of prostate uh, cancer to get screened. Wow. Yeah, and that is because of the way that the two most popular methods for prostate screenings work and the risk of um, false positives. So CDC recommends that prostate havers between the ages of 55 and 69 make a decision with their health providers to weigh the pros and cons. Um, And I'm going to get into that in just a little bit. So I want to talk about how prostate screenings work. Um, there are two ways to get screened for prostate cancer. The first is to test is a blood test, actually. And you're testing for prostate-specific antigens, or PSAs. Uh, according to the CDC, the higher the PSA level in the blood, the more likely that a prostate problem is present. But many factors, such as age and race, can affect PSA levels. And some prostate glands make more PSA than others. Uh, For instance, high levels of PSAs can be a sign of prostate infection, a side effect of medication, or caused by benign prostate enlargement, which is just, uh, as you get older, your prostate just tends to swell, and it uh, can cause problems, uh, discomfort as you get older, but it's not life, it's not um, particularly harmful, more uncomfortable. It can make it difficult to urinate. I feel like that was a PSA on PSAs. (laughs) (laughs) Kind of, it's... (laughs) You know, the lesson is always things are more complicated than they see. <laughs> oh. Um, but yes, it was a PSA on PSAs. <laughs> Great. That was a good joke. Thanks. I didn't mean to steamroll over. Nope. <laughs> Dang it. <laughs> uh, I'm an idiot. Okay. Um. <laughs> So PSA tests carry a risk of misdiagnosis and overtreatment. Uh, the problem there, the reason why the CDC is hesitant to make a blanket uh, re- recommendation is that uh, PSA tests come with the risk of doing more harm than good. The uh, U.S. Preventive Services Task Force gives PSA tests a C rating as a, pre- as a preventative measure, saying screening offers a small potential benefit of reducing the chance of death from prostate cancer in some men. So basically the verdict that I got from both of their websites, the uh, Preventive Services Task Force and the CDC, was that in a lot of cases the cons outweigh the pros because they lead to unnecessary bi- biopsies, unnecessary treatments, and surgery that can reduce your uh, quality of life Uh, they also cause erectile dysfunction and incontinence so um that's the skinny on uh on uh, psas Uh, the other kind of screening is a digital rectal examination and that's not digital as in over the internet that is with your fingies (laughs) So it's, it's, again, it's, it's what you're picturing. The healthcare provider sticks a gloved, lubricated finger into your rectum and then feels for the prostate on the outside of the bowel. Um, and what they're feeling for, again, is for swelling and uh, hardness. The beginning of your sentence started mm. out a lot sexier than the end of your sentence. Yep. <laughs> it always does. 
Um, <laughs> but here's the twist. Um, the use of a digital rectal examination is not recommended by the CDC or the Preventive, Preventive Services Task Force. Um, in fact, they said that the use of digital rectal examination as a screening modality is not recommended because there is a lack of evidence on the benefits. Digital rectal examination was either eliminated from or not included in major screening trials. So we have better ways. The, the blood test is the better way to screen for it. And even then, it comes with some cons. Um, so what you're telling me is that there's no way to screen for this? No, there is, but <laughs> the you the the risk is that uh, the rise in in PSAs can be caused is just as likely to be caused by something that's benign. So unless you and your doctor have identified that you are at a higher risk for prostate cancer, then you don't really. I'm not going to recommend. This is not this is a, this is not a medical advice podcast. This is not. <laughs> I'm not a doctor. I. Uh, <laughs> but um, it sounds like what the CDC is saying is that you need to carefully weigh the pros and cons with your physician right. if uh, before you get screened. That is interesting. That's like mm-hmm. very different than than how uterus havers screen in. Right? That sounds like the negative aspect. Right. <laughs> like before we were complaining, and now I think, all right, I might be okay with what we've got. <laughs> Yeah, like this is usually when it comes to medicine and the genders, it's not great to have a uterus because for several years, medical research was done under the guise that uh, women are just men with more hormones. Yeah. (laughs) All right. Which has led to several complications throughout the years because that shit ain't true. (laughs) (laughs) But this sounds like one of the times where it's like, okay. Okay, I, I can deal with the, uh, the um, is it speculum? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll yeah. That's fine. This I choose fine. uterus. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the thing about prostate cancer is that uh, it grows slowly, if it grows at all, and it's not commonly life-threatening. So sometimes even if you have it, it may grow at such a slow rate that it is not in danger of ever threatening your life. Oh. So you might as well just keep your prostate. It's just a it's it's a it's like a a polite rubate, inconvenient to have, but everything's fine. Yeah, kind of, yeah. <laughs> is is colon cancer the more deadly one? I didn't do any research on colon cancer. I don't know. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> did you did you, did you do any research on it? I well, focused I mean, focused on my bits. <laughs> I mean, um, okay. So, all that said, prostate cancer is still potentially life threatening. So there are certain signs that you have prostate cancer. So that would include difficulty urinating, frequent urination, difficulty emptying the bladder completely, blood in the urine or semen, pain in the back, hips, or pelvis that doesn't go away, and painful ejaculation. So if you are having any of those symptoms, I mean, definitely see your doctor. I mean, if I saw any of those things, (laughs) I would go see someone. (laughs) But again, I mean... You had me at painful ejaculation. Yeah, that doesn't sound great, That was the last one, Megan. (laughs) (laughs) Wait, yeah. You weren't convinced by blood in the urine? (laughs) (laughs) Whatever. Ejaculation? Ooh, that shit needs to be fixed. (laughs) Uh, and okay so most of everything that i have been talking about um applies to well okay so we'll say if you have a prostate all of this applies to you however with trans women who are have undergone a um transition bottom and, surgery and well not 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 just bottom surgery um the horm uh, the hormones you take oh. actually reduce there is not a lot of literature on it but what evidence there is seems to suggest that the hormones reduce your chance of getting prostate cancer so i thought that was very interesting i think this is one of those areas that actually uh sex ed in america since it is usually associated with health class this is one thing that i think has been pretty well covered in today's um 
in today's education, like I, I, I knew about checking for, for lumps through all sorts of things. So I'm glad everyone should be aware of their bodies. Everyone should take a look out for cancer. Cancer sucks in any way, shape, or form. So being able to catch it early and treat it is so key with any yeah. type of cancer. I will say the one thing about, um, I think the reason that we know so much about cancers um, with any of our naughty bits um, in high school health class uh, is probably because a lot of, especially for uterus havers, um, I remember them actively being like, the only way to avoid this is by not having multiple sexual partners and like kind of shaming people who are explorative with sex. So like, yeah, I think it was like a threatening way to say stay virgins forever. Gotcha. Um, okay, so that statement is not true. Being abstinent will not protect you from not having cancer. Yeah. Um, the studies on preventing cancer are uh, cancer happens in the same way that shitty things in life happens. Yeah. And there are certain factors that increase your likelihood of getting it, but it, if you don't do these things, it will not stop you from getting it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm not blind to the fact that HPV is something that you can contract sexually and that can increase your chances of getting cancer. I'm not blind to that fact at all. Yeah. Um, I just also think that a lot of sex ed was, these things will happen. You will die. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but you can, definitely. Um, so some things that are preventative um, for all cancers and for all health things, a healthy diet is a preventative measure because the higher your immune system is, the more your body can fight off cancer. So eating right will um, help prevent cancer. There's also studies to show that the, there are certain foods like blueberries and certain spices like turmeric that help prevent cancer. Um, on top of that, uh, exercising regularly. Again, it's just keeping your body in the best shape it possibly can because cancer is there to kill your immune system. The better immune system that you have, the better chances you have of fighting against it. But you could be the healthiest person on the planet and still get it, unfortunately. So there are other studies also to say that in terms of breast cancer... Uh, women who do not have children before the age of 30, for some reason, are more likely to get it. Women who do not breastfeed, for some reason, are more likely to get it. Uh, the older you wait to have children or not have children also increases your chances, and nobody knows why. Wait, the older you wait to have children or not have children? So, like... The older you wait to have children, or if you choose never to have children, you are more likely to have breast cancer. Jeez. Ugh. No matter like, what you do. But that is not a reason to have children. There are so many studies out there on cancer prevention, um, but from everything I can tell in the reading and talking to people, it's just... It's so random. It is so random. Wait, did, did you see any things that increase other than hereditary things? Uh, no. What I read uh, indicated that it was mostly, yeah, mostly due to f family history and weirdly race. And I don't know how to feel about that. Like, is it? I don't know how to feel about the saying that women who choose not to have kids are more likely for it. Yeah. <laughs> Both weird. <laughs> Both weird. Yeah. All weird. All weird. Okay. So that is the cancer prevention awareness. Now, something that's kind of weird, I think, in our society is that we don't, like, we don't start cheering for boobs or, actually, we're always cheering for boobs. Everyone's boobs. cheering for boobs. Men, women, homosexuals, everyone's cheering for boobs. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but, like, you know what I mean? Like, you don't really start celebrating the naughty bits until you're going to lose them. Appreciate your bits. Yeah. So I wanted to do a little bit of celebration of the naughty Fondle bits. Fondle your testicles as you're listening to this podcast, please. <laughs> Ooh, okay. That took a turn. <laughs> so I wanted to share some fun facts. 
please do Meg. With you guys. Bring it. Bring on the cheer. Bring on the joy. Yes. Let's appreciate our bits. All right. I'm going to start with penises. Uh, your first erection either happens in the womb or as you're born. There are <laughs> ultrasounds showing your baby's first erection. Just flying that flag. <laughs> I'm proud. That is strange. <laughs> yeah, it's weird, right? Yeah. As we assume an erection with sexual arousal, but... Nope. Uh, erections have nothing... Or they do have... Okay, what's the right way to phrase this? If you're sexually aroused, you're more than likely having an erection unless you are medically incapable of having one, of which there are so many things to help you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, But if you have an erection, it doesn't mean you're sexually aroused. Right. And it doesn't equal consent. Nope, it does not. Um, You, men very frequently have erections while they're in the REM cycle of their sleep. Mm -hmm. That's where morning wood comes from. Mm -hmm. Uh, Colin. Mm -hmm. Yes. Your penis. Mine specifically. Is twice as long as you think it is. Oh, good. (laughs) I always always had that thought in the back of my mind, and now I know it's true. (laughs) Please, please tell me more, Megan. (laughs) Um, So... Half of a of the the penis is actually housed inside of the body, so half of it is external, and the other half is inside, uh, connected to the rest of your reproductive system. Oh, okay, yeah, that makes me really want to look up the percentage of the clitoris that's housed inside of the body. It's oh, girl, high. it's very high, but I don't it's know high. the percentage. Huh? It's it's high. Oh. Yeah, it's very high, but I don't know. I can't remember the percentage. Do you think it's like six feet long, all coiled up? Which is why all body, all over body orgasms. <laughs> <laughs> um, so da, 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 da. we talked about this before uh, with Doctor Harris, but you can break your penis. I'm I'm chuckling because I may have had a partner deal with this problem. You have? Yeah. <laughs> Oh, no. I'm sorry. How was the visit to the emergency room? Yeah, was that? Yeah. (laughs) Oh, my gosh. That's awful. Yeah, it wasn't great. Awful for everyone involved. It wasn't 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 great. Whenever I've heard women describe this experience, they're always chuckling. Probably more out of (laughs) discomfort. Yeah, I think that's it. I still feel bad for this gentleman, too. He really didn't speak to me much after. Oh, my God. I think from shame. I mean, that would be shameful. No, it's not. It would feel feel shameful. It would be easy to be embarrassed about, but it takes two. That's the best way to put it. It It takes two. It takes two to snap your old... (laughs) Your drop strap. Yeah, snap. (laughs) Yep. Penile fracture, as it is known, is actually the rupture of the fib... Fibrose covering of the corpora cavernosa. Sure. Okay. Which is okay. the <laughs> tissue that becomes erect when engorged with blood. So you're right. It is the rupturing oh, tissue. Horrifying. Most cases happen when the partner is on top. Wait, which partner? The sexual partner. Usually. They're both sexual. If two people are having sex, they're both the sexual partner. The sexual partner to the person who had the penile fracture. Gotcha. Thank you. (laughs) Sorry to not be specific enough. I just needed a little clarification. So I have a tiny fun fact. Awesome. A tiny Um, one, you say? The foods that will help the flavor of the semen. Oh. Pineapple juice? Sorry? Is pineapple juice on there? Uh, So so it's, uh, according to the Kinsey Institute, uh, specifically for semen, they recommend fruits, uh, including citruses. They didn't say specifically pineapple. They just said citrus. Um, Bananas and papayas. And then as far as spices, they recommend cinnamon, nutmeg, peppermint, um, and then parsley, wheatgrass, and celery. Huh. Excellent. That's a pretty healthy diet, too. Great healthy yeah. diet. Want to know what makes it worse? Yes. 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 Um, cigarettes. Makes huh. sense. I'm just going to, like, 
highlight another reason if you needed another reason to stop smoking. Uh, caffeine, <laughs> red meat, onions, and garlic. So basically, if oh, it makes garlic. your breath oh, taste bad, no. it makes your cum taste bad. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I like so many of those things, though. Yeah. Garlic, garlic's the killer. <laughs> Fun facts Why about vaginas. Um, so the female reproductive system is complex and mostly internal. So I've been told. Um, and usually when we say vagina, uh, we mean the whole thing when actually the vagina is uh, one opening of the three sandwiched between the two. <laughs> um, that only the opening leading from, uh, your vulva to your uterus is the vagina. Uh, usually when we're talking about it, we're actually talking about vulvas, but we're going to give a pass. <laughs> 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 um, so we earlier mentioned about clitorises. Clitorati. Clitorati. <laughs> um, and for those who don't know where it is, if you imagine a vagina like an avocado, mm. right? Or... The pit, we'll say, is your vagina. And then the tip above the pit, like close to like the uh, shape, that's where the clitoris is hiding out at. Oh, okay. <laughs> now I know. Call it. Oh, wow. <laughs> Who'd have thunk? Um, and it is the tip of the iceberg because most of your, um, most of your clitoris is actually hidden underneath the skin um, a surrounding your like uterus like between your uterus and your vagina and if you imagine your clitoris is actually kind of shaped like a wishbone huh yeah so like i can't remember the exact percentage of how much of it is sticking out in that little nub um but it's like 10 nub to, we all know and love yeah it's like 10 to 20 percent it's okay. very it's a very small percentage of the rest of the sex organ oh yeah which is the controversy as to whether or not the g-spot exists right it's whether or not you're actually hitting mm the the rest of the clitoris from within the vagina correct so usually when people mention g-spot what they actually mean is so like if your clitoris is swollen up because similar to penises um blood rushes to the clitoris and the vagina during sex for women uh that engorges and uh depending on how big it is or where it's placed within the particular body uh, that's what's being rubbed against during penetrative sex, causing you to orgasm. So, like, that's the usually when we talk about G spot, that's what we're talking about. Mm. It's the position in your body that's rubbing up against the rest of your clitoris internally. Getting the whole deal. Yeah, the whole thing. Um, so when human beings are fetuses, there are a lot of things that are exactly the same between men and women that do not get assigned until later in the fetal development and one of them is a clitoris is actually a penis and a penis is actually a clitoris mm -hmm. they are the same and then when the um gender organs are assigned that's when they differentiate okay um and the, the another difference between the two is the penis has about four thousand nerve endings Whereas a clitoris has 8,000. Oh, my gosh. Mm -hmm. It is very sensitive. Um, many, many women can only achieve orgasm through clitoral uh, stimulation. In fact, I've seen varying statistics on this, but somewhere about 20% say that they can achieve orgasm through penetrative sex. So most women are achieving orgasm through clitoral stimulation. I'm writing that down. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, some women can achieve orgasm through both stimulation simultaneously into a combined orgasm, mm. which is just gravy. That does sound nice. <laughs> uh, there are some women who can achieve orgasm through stimulation of um, the cervix, which I did not know because in the times that s the cervix has been reached during sex for me, it's been very painful. Yeah, that's always been my impression of hitting the cervix. Yeah, but apparently some women can achieve orgasm through it. Huh. Interesting. Yeah, yeah that is really interesting. Right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, something that I learned is uh, during sex, not only does the vagina widen, it 
grows deeper. Ooh. And this is to allow for extra space for the penis to insert without hittering, hittering, hitting the uterus. Ah. Yeah. Um... So, again, uh, vaginas are naturally supposed to smell. Vaginas are self-cleaning. Um, if the smell is abnormal or the discharge is abnormal, that's when you go to your doctor. But you are supposed to have vaginal discharge. You are supposed to... Your vagina is supposed to smell. It's all part of a natural, beautiful process of your body keeping itself healthy. And on top of saying that you don't have to, if you are erect or if you ejaculate, that is not consent. If a vagina is wet, that is also not consent. Vaginas are naturally wet. Yeah. Um, to uh, harken back to the thing you said just before that, um, just like with uh, taste, uh, there are things that you can do for the smell of a vagina. Um, and that's specifically uh, water. Uh, the number one thing when I was doing research about um, can you can you change the flavor um, uh, of your uh, vaginal secretions? Um, it was just the more you drink water, the healthier your vagina is, the more natural the smell is. Everything is just better if you drink water. Huh. Keep your bits hydrated. Just keep drinking that water. Just keep drinking and water. Again, to come back to how you're naturally supposed to, your vagina is naturally supposed to have things going on, you are only supposed to, unless medically prescribed, you're only supposed to wash your vagina with water, which is why detachable shower heads are great. And even if you rent, you can install them. <laughs> and I think something that should be harked on in this list of fun facts is that not only all orgasms are earth shattering and the medial portrayal of the female orgasm is not particularly great. So if you are feeling self-conscious that you're not screaming at the top of your lungs, like you see in some TV shows or porn or anything, it's not supposed to be that way. So take yourself out of the media and explore your sexuality at your pace. It's a journey, <laughs> not a destination. <laughs> and um, I found this interesting. Um, uh, masturbation can help with cramps during a menstrual cycle. I did not know that. Mm -hmm. It rushes blood to the area and it helps relieve pain. Oh. <laughs> Good May endorphins. It's like chocolate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and... Um, I found some, so while I was going down the uh, uh, vaginal, like, fun fact road, I, of course, found a ton of, like, different studies on female orgasm and whatnot. And um, while there are some women who cannot physically have sex, uh, for the majority of women who have not experienced an orgasm, it's mental. And unfortunately... The amount of women who report never having an orgasm in their life is increasing. What? Mm hmm Despite the amount of information on the internet and the increase of access to uh, uh, sexual consultants and uh, therapists, it's increasing. And um, there are some articles hypothesizing that the reason that it's increasing is due to misrepresentation of the female orgasm in modern media. Really? Mm -hmm. Like that it's just supposed to come from penetration? It's just supposed to go from, come from penetration. The fact that you're supposed to be like mm. coming as soon as he's inside you. Clitoris havers, stop faking orgasms. <laughs> I agree with that statement. <laughs> Let your partners work for it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so boobs. Boobies. Um, Rests. So, Bazongas. 50 years ago, the world average breast size was a size B. Today, it's a 36D. Shut up. And the reason for that. Shut the front door. <laughs> Why? How? Wait a second. No. Why? Wait, Two game. reasons. Uh, uh, first oh. is diet, <laughs> uh -huh. and second is plastic surgery. Oh. Mm hmm. Uh -huh. And in fact, that 36D size is only the average in um, 
the United States, United Kingdom, and Canada, for most of the rest of the world, it is still a size B. Um, there is nothing you can do to stop breast sagging. Mm. Um, exercise, like pectorals, will help like strengthen like appearance surrounding the breast, but it will not keep them up. Um, losing, like, uh, it has been... It is true that if you sleep on your stomach, you can stretch them. Or if you're not wearing a supportive enough uh, sports bra, the collective bouncing can also increase stretching. But there's actual nothing to stop sagging. It is the natural development of time. The only thing you can do to correct sagging is plastic surgery. And I am a huge proponent of every person on this planet being comfortable with their own body and making choices to be comfortable with their own body the way i'm gonna choose to be comfortable with my own body following childbirth is bringing the girls right back up (laughs) okay i found this fascinating so the reason that men have breasts is because again fetuses are the same my breasts and your breasts are technically the same we are, the, we are the same. And it's the hormones that develop the mammary glands and make the women bigger. And to add on to that, human beings are the only species on the planet that have permanently engorged breasts. Other primates engorge their breasts during um, child rearing while oh. they're breastfeeding, but then they go back down. Really? Mm-hmm. So breasts are not just fat. Uh, obviously extra body fat can lead to them being bigger, uh, on top of everything else on your body growing in size, but there's several, several layers of, um, mammary glands as well as like, uh, lymph nodes and other things that go into a breast that even if you lose as much weight as you possibly can, you will still have something protruding out because it is not just fat up in there. And 80% of women are not correctly sized for bras. Oh, wow. (laughs) That's awful. Yep. Uh, Breasts also constantly change through your cycle. It is not abnormal to be one full cup size bigger during your menstrual cycle or vice versa. Mm. And um, 60% of women report one breast size being larger than the other. And for some reason, for most cases, it's the left one. Really? (laughs) That's crazy. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> that was obviously, like, looks down. That's so weird. <laughs> yeah, that's Wait, a visual bit. <laughs> visual bits. Yeah. Um, many women c- report uh, orgasm from nipple play mm. and nipple play alone. Really? really? Yeah. Hmm. I'll write that down, too. Happens for <laughs> men, too. Or penis havers. Uh-huh. Sorry. Oh, this is what I was saying. So, yeah, each breast has six to nine overlapping sections called lobes. Within each lobe are many smaller lobules, which end in dozens of tiny bulbs that can produce milk. It is incredibly common, and I need everyone to hear this, it is incredibly common for uterus havers to have dark hairs on their nipples. Mm. Straight up thick boys. (laughs) Two to 15. (laughs) Right, so... Not to the same level as, like, ma- uh, male chest hair, but it is very common. And so if you have plucked some away, that's okay. <laughs> You're not alone. I think as a Latina, I'm sitting here like, duh. And then I'm realizing that that is probably <laughs> surprising information to people with lighter hair. <laughs> I'm yeah. like, yeah. <laughs> and that, I think a lot of men don't know that, too. <laughs> Like, I think given the amount of hair removal that happens on a female body, guys are just kind of like, what? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, my last one, and this is going to be the gross one. So when you die, <laughs> right, everything erodes away except any metal, like teeth crowns or permanent retainers or like mm-hmm. bone implants bones and breast implants that kind of makes sense actually yeah. they're not yeah. organic i guess so like during cremation for example your bones will remain after the coronet coroner has cremated you and they report finding um like a plastic goo on like the rib cage of oh. women who've had pr- breast implants that's kind of horrifying i didn't yeah. need that 
So that's the that's the that's the uh, over, uh, Halloween I, overlap I fact. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sexual Spooktober is back. <laughs> Spooktual no no sex member. Hmm. So those are those are the things that I learned. You learned so much. Those were the fun facts. Those are the fun facts. The funnest facts. The funnest of facts. Uh, Most fun. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for listening and um, learning, hopefully, something about your bits. Uh, if you weren't your bits. cancer aware before, Love. you're definitely now. <laughs> Love your bits. Love your bits. Get them screened. Do a self-exam. Go to a doctor. Go to Planned Parenthood. You have options. Touch your partner. <laughs> touch your partner. Touch yourself. Consensually. <laughs> I'm Megan. I'm Marcella. And I'm Colin. Bye. Bye. You will agree that the concepts will contribute to the rearing of a mature person. Um, an absence of... Oh yeah, you don't have to be thinking about that. <laughs>